Welcome to Aberdeen Proving Grounds Hidden History. I am your host, Sean Keefe, with my co host, Susan Thompson. Hello, Susan. Hi, Sean. How are you today? I am fantastic. Are you ready for episode two? I am ready to hear about what we're going to talk about. What are we going to talk about, Susan? Well, we're going to talk about APG's Pools Island today. And I've taken it upon myself, Susan, as I always do, right. to title this week's episode. Get, are you ready for this, I, Susan? I, I have been waiting to hear this. Because we should this. have a drum roll. Drum roll, please. <laughs> peaches and punches at pools. Oh, you know, I was kind of thinking peaches galore. Peaches galore? <laughs> No, 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 no. You got it wrong. It's fishes galore. Fishes galore. Or fish galore. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, So this is exciting because one thing that's very iconic about Aberdeen Proving Ground is the Pools Island Lighthouse. Yes. There's a lot of mystery around Pools Island. That's true. I've never been there. I, Susan, I got one up on you now (laughs) because I have had the privilege of being at Pools Island. Yeah. And I will discuss my adventure there later in the episode. All right. I'm looking forward to it. But before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who downloaded our first episode. It was more than we could have hoped for. I mean, I think what were we? we were way over a thousand. Right. Almost. I think the last time I looked, it was almost 1800 downloads. That's incredible. At least I feel it is. Right. I mean, because, you know, we're just two people we're here. We're just two government workers <laughs> doing our day job. And I also have to give a shout out to our staff. We have Drew Monith, who has been doing all the promotional material. So every time you see something on Facebook or Instagram, that's Drew doing his magic. Joni Messenger created that wonderful cover photo of the both of us. And I have to say, Susan, we are adorable. That's true, Sean. 50 never looks so good. I'm telling you. What is it? 50 is the new 30, right? That's right. Is that what they're saying? And I have to say, we have faces made for podcasting. The, I, hey, <laughs> speak for yourself over there. Come on now. <laughs> Very excited uh, to be on our second episode here. This has originally been planned for a four-episode run. And for what I spent on this equipment, Susan, that puts us at about $2 million an episode. <laughs> that seems about right for yeah. government work, Yeah, right? there you go. You know, if you want to learn more about APG and there's a topic that we haven't mentioned or discussed, please leave a comment on our Facebook site. That's right. Susan and I would love to hear what everyone has to say. Because we have nothing to talk about. We have nothing to talk about. (laughs) I do want to let our audience know our approach to the podcast. All right. So pretty much Susan and I will decide on a topic. Like last week's episode was Spasuti Island. After we have decided what the episode is going to be on, we both go our separate ways, we do our own research, and then we come together here face-to-face and just discuss everything that we have researched. Right. We have a conversation about what we've learned, what we haven't been able to find anything on, what we think about it, that general kind of information. Which is actually pretty difficult because in our work environment, we sit very close to each other, so it's hard not to want to share information. But what we found out initially was that we would create a dialogue and I would have to remind myself, this is what the podcast is. Right. So here we are. We both have little notes of our own, nothing scripted, and we're about to have a conversation about Pools Island. All right. Let's do it. So today, as we talk about Pools Island, I wanted to give you a little background about why we picked Pools Island. So the history of Pools Island and APG in general is really the history of America and a tiny little... Oh, I like that. The history of America. (laughs) Wonderful. On on a tiny... It's only about a 200-acre island, so it's not a big place. But Pools Island represents the American Revolution, art, agriculture, and its early dependence on enslaved labor, maritime navigation and tragedy, sporting and leisure, and military use, all on, as we said, this tiny little island just off the southern coast of Aberdeen Proving Ground. So that's interesting, Susan, because in 1612, when the island was first mapped by Captain John Smith and his expedition of the Chesapeake Bay, the island was recorded as being close to 300 acres or over 300 acres. Right. I've seen a lot of different 
sizes for it in deeds and in reference. Sometimes it says 280 acres. Um, a couple deeds have said 250 acres or so. Later deeds say 234 acres. It is shrinking over time. I mean, that's just the natural process. But that's process. natural for an island right. in the Chesapeake to right. do. Right. So, I mean, that's that's affecting a lot of the islands of the Chesapeake is that they're losing ground over time. And Pools Island is no different. Bet- somewhere between 200 and 300 acres, but probably a little closer to 200 than it used to be. Got it. And as you mentioned in our, our first episode, Susan, John Smith named the island after someone in his expedition named Nathaniel Powell. Yes, that's correct. Originally, as we said, it was called Powell's Island. Very quickly, that name got changed to pools, some derivation of pools. It was even called pools, isles, plural at one point in time. But um, we don't know if that was just a change over time, people's dialects. Um, There are some natural springs, I guess, in the center of the island. So that may have played a role in how the name has changed. But it's, you know, you will see it spelled P-O-O-L apostrophe S, and sometimes there's an E, and often there's not an apostrophe with either spelling. So you kind of, to do the research was a little difficult for us because the name changes all the time. You have to like look at a lot of different terms to figure out what you're looking for. Because even going back to the 19th century, it seemed like I could not find anything on pools with the E. Right. And then I dropped the E and just went to P-O-O-L and then just a bunch of information right. came up. Right. And if you do take an aerial view of the island, it does like look like there are little pools spread out through the island. Right. I mean, I guess we can agree on that one thing that we do know is that we don't know how the island evolved into pools. Right. It, you know, it's one of those mysteries lost to time that even we can't shed any light it's on. It's like an APG hidden mystery, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? There you go. Okay. <laughs> So where do we go to now? All right. So um, just like Spasuti, which was the to- our last topic, first land patent for the island was 1658. So the same time frame as uh, Nathaniel Udi was given his, his patent for the island. This one was given to a Captain Robert Morris. I really couldn't find much information on him. So really, Pools Island comes into American history right before the American Revolution when it is purchased by a man named John Beale Bordley. Mm-hmm. Bordley is a really interesting guy. He was native to Maryland. He was orphaned very young, um, and his mother remarried and moved to England. So he was left with aunts and uncles and like sort of raised on both the western shore and the eastern shore. So he spent a lot of his childhood in Kent County. Now, Kent County seems like it's far away, but we know our Kent County friends are actually very close to APG if you go across the water. Correct. So going by route of land is much more difficult. And it is. And Susan, look what I found out for you. Okay. From Aberdeen Proving Ground to Kent County is 67.7 miles away. And that's about an hour and 30 minutes by car. Okay. From the shore of Pools Island to Kent County, you're only looking at about a distance of four miles. Right. It's, it's very close by water. So even though currently we may not think of them as geographically close, they were. In colonial times, Kent County and what is now APG would be close because people were using the waterways. That mm-hmm. was a main way of transportation. Do you think they hear things that go boom in the night? I know in Kent County they do hear oh, our shucks. booms. Here we go. Strike that from the record. <laughs> John Beale Bordley. Evidently, he had an older brother named John. Um, So John had an older brother, John? John had an older brother, John. So he went by the name of Beale. So if you hear me say Beale, it's because sometimes he's referred to in literature that way. Um, Later in life, he added the John back once his elder brother had died. But um, he went to school in Kent County in Chestertown um, at the school of Reverend Charles Peel who is the father of Charles Wilson Peel, who we'll talk about a little bit later. That I know, yes. I know Charles Wilson Peel. So while he was living in Kent County, 
he really saw a sense of the different types of agriculture that were prominent in Maryland at the time. So further south, there was a lot of tobacco Mm -hmm. growing. Which was prominent in Maryland. Which was prominent, but it was really a luxury cash crop that was being sold to England versus the wheat growers who were more common around the northern Kent County area. And so he saw this early on and he saw that maybe the wheat growers were a little more prosperous. He became a clerk for Baltimore County in 1753. And at this time, he was living on a farm in Joppa, Maryland, very close to here we, yes, where we are now. to the Edgewood area. Yes. So that was a farm that he had inherited from his deceased father. So this was considered the wilderness at the time, even though Joppa was sort of the, mm-hmm. the county seat of Baltimore. But in his role as clerk of Baltimore County, he was registering a lot of, he was doing a lot of work for the county, trying to recover taxes and things like that. And he was finding that the tobacco growers were in debt and they were not prosperous because of the way the agricultural system was set up. It was being sold to England And they had control over how many taxes. You had to have a factor who would like sell your tobacco to Mm -hmm. a big company in England. So and the tax taxes were being levied by the English. Taxes were being levied by the English, and so this is to give you a little bit of background about why he's an interesting person Mm -hmm. and how this ties into Pools Island. In 1770, his wife inherits a property from her elder brother. In she inherits half of it, and her sister and her sister's husband, who was William Packa. Um, oh, William Packa of the Declaration of Independence. Right, right. He Correct. was he was one of the Maryland signers of the Declaration of Independence. The William well, Packa House is still in Correct. Annapolis and Packa today. Packa Street down in Baltimore. Right. So he he is a big name that you've probably heard of. He's Whereas, a pretty big deal. That's what we say. <laughs> Whereas John Beale Bordley, you probably haven't heard of him. Not at all. No. Or Beale, as I like to call him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So um, so in 1770, he and his wife and his sister-in-law and brother-in-law inherited Y Island in Kent County, okay. which was um, about a 5,000-acre island. And he, they inherited about half of it. And then in 1771, he purchases Pools Island from a local man named John Carville for about 1,200 pounds. And so he really starts setting himself up as an experimenter in agriculture. He was looking to develop a scientific method to improving agricultural yields. And he actually wrote about this and published a book in the 1790s um, that was called Essays and Notes on Husbandry and Rural Affairs. And he, you know, he sent copies of this to George Washington, who he was friends with. So, mm. I mean, this was getting a lot of play. Good, friend to be, good person to be friends with. Right, right. But the reason this is interesting is because in about 1770, he wrote a pamphlet that was anonymous at the time, which he later published as a, one of the chapters in that book I just referenced. And it was called Necessaries. Best Product of Land, Best Style of Commerce. And in Mm. this essay, so it's really an enlightenment period kind of thing, he was making the argument that America should be moving away from providing luxuries to the British. Oh, okay. Um, Because you have to remember at this time, one of the big schemes in America was developing silk. Oh. Benjamin Franklin was in on it. There were like all these southern colonies were trying to develop, you know, silk oh, I mills. I always thought and silk was imported, would, would have been imported at that time, correct? Well, they were trying to create a new market. The mm-hmm. British emphasized this because they wanted America to be providing all their luxury goods so that they, because of course we were still a colony at the time. Right. So they wanted, because they had control mm-hmm. of the taxes and they could, you know, they could dictate what we're growing and selling. This so, sounds like it could almost lead to war, you know. It's amazing. <laughs> so, Jeez. so John okay. Beale Bordley, he's writing this in the 1770s, like right at the time he inherited mm-hmm. and bought these properties and setting them up as these independent farms. Now, did he have about six different islands? Did he, he own or owned, farms? He owned at least seven farms. Farms. Farms okay. in Kent County and Harford County and Baltimore. And, so he and, was a man on a mission. He was a man on the mission. Um, 
But so the, his his this treatise called Necessaries. No, not what you're thinking. Okay, <laughs> I'm not thinking anything. That, that's just the, nothing going that, on in this head. <laughs> that's the word he used. <laughs> he really made the argument that American farming needed to be focused on providing the necessaries of life: food, cloth. So that you could feed yourself, so that you could clothe yourself, so that America could be self-sufficient. He was really a proponent of the organic industrial base Wow! long before (laughs) that became one of our catchwords here in the military base. So he sets up Y Island. He, you know, he's trying to make a point to, uh, because he he has a half brother in England Mm -hmm. that he's communicating with because, you know, his mother had moved to England. So he's very close with people in England, but he's at the same time seeing the issues with the way the two countries are interacting. And he's, he's making a point. And to get back to Charles Wilson Peel, he knew Wilson Peel from a young age because he studied with Charles Wilson Peel's father. And he actually, along with some others, paid for Charles Wilson Peel to go to England to study art under Benjamin West, who was another very famous artist at the Mm -hmm. time. Charles Wilson Peel was the only famous American artist at the time who came back after the revolution. And he's really responsible for creating our modern image of what the revolution and revolutionaries looked like. But his first commission was a full-length portrait of John Beale Bordley. And this is available for viewing at the National Gallery of Art. You can also look at it on their website. But in this portrait, he makes a very strong statement about what American agriculture should be. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an allegorical painting. So he's standing full length. In the background is his Y Island plantation right on the Chesapeake Bay. A peach tree and a pack horse signify America's abundance, while the grazing sheep speak for freedom from imported British woolens. Um, There's themes of tyranny and trying to escape that. He was a lawyer by training, so he has ripped up documents at his feet to show that England is... I got to see this painting. (laughs) This sounds... Incredible. So, um, so it's really he he's he's very much a thinker of the time, you know, and yeah. he's he's friends with everyone you think of, mm-hmm. Benjamin well, Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, you name it. That's he a party knew- <laughs> right there, because Charles Wilson Peale is considered pretty much the painter for the American Revolution. That's correct. I mean, he was commissioned to do the first painting of George Washington. Right. At the Battle of Trenton, sometime, I think there's several versions. He also did one at the Battle of Princeton. Um, But he really, you know, is documenting the people you've heard about. Mm -hmm. Would you hear about the American Revolution? So, and one thing to to think about while we're talking about John Beale Bordley is like Jefferson, like Washington, he had a a relationship with slavery, which, you know, he he owned slaves, he had inherited them, but philosophically, he didn't agree with the idea of slavery. He thought it didn't agree with the principles of, of being egalitarian. He thought it was a very harsh practice in real life. He felt that by American agriculture relying on slavery, that we were became slaves to to the system to the system and that it was not a profitable way to be so over the course of his lifetime he freed a lot of his slaves he sent them out for apprenticeships so that they could gain more skills but even while he was developing these new agricultural processes he was relying on slave labor Correct. so that's something to think about it's mm-hmm. always there when we're talking about i mean even here at APG these islands, there was there were slaves who were, or enslaved people who were doing the labor. It sounds like he was a little bit of a forward thinker in a way, but still a product of his time. Right. So while, you know, talking a little bit about our process, we have to dig a lot to find some of these resources that we're talking about. Let's not joke. It's a lot, Susan. <laughs> Come on. Come on. It is a lot. And Nine because... in the morning to nine at night. We do not stop. We are dedicated to this podcast. Because, you know, and that's what we want to emphasize, why it's hidden history, because these are like little things that aren't all gathered in one place. You know, we're hoping that by us talking about them, it's a little more accessible. If you find something that you're interested in, mm-hmm. you know, go explore. You never know what you'll find. Except stay off the proving ground. Do not seek out these locations with peace and love. Peace and love. Stay away from Pools Island. 
That's right. So when we say go explore, we, ma- we mean the... From, from your computer. From your computer. Because <laughs> no, there's, just, there's, not, not exactly, but... There, there's lots of information. Yes. For those who live and work on APG, join us on December 8th for this year's C5 ISR Holiday Party, where Top of the Bay will be transformed into APG's biggest Bavarian experience. You'll enjoy Bavarian food and drinks, an authentic Christmas market, the biggest dance floor on the installation, and many more surprises throughout the night. Tickets are available now. Check out the APG Facebook and Instagram pages for more information. You won't want to miss this one-of-a-kind experience only at the C5 ISR Holiday Party. We are now up to the American Revolution. And Beale still has possession of Pools Island. Correct. So he maintains, he had grand plans for Pools Island, which kind of got a little bit derailed by the revolution. I mean, even his big farm at Y Island was invaded by some British troops. But even though he didn't get to enact all the scientific experiments he wanted to, his his ideals were really proved right because he used the resources, the wheat and the cattle that he was raising on Pools Island to help feed the American army. And I know that on Y Island, he had a gunpowder factory. Right. He was really trying to be self-sufficient at his farm on Y Island. A true patriot. Yes. There you go. So Bordley moved to Philadelphia about 1791 with his second wife. Um, he was given a, a position by George Washington as a commissioner for the First Bank of America to um, to gain subscribers for it. So he, he really became involved in the Philadelphia scene. And then he passed away in about 1804. And at that point, his estate was being managed by his daughters and his sons. And I did a little deed digging and a little deed research. And so the Pools Island was sold in 1808 to um, a John Middleton, who then also passed away. So I don't think the fees were ever collected because then in 1811, there was another farmer from Kent County who has a wonderful name called... I love this name. Peregrine Weathered. There you go. So Middleton was kind of like the middleman. Right. There you go. And you'd be surprised that there are quite a few peregrines running around at the time. It's, it's, I think we should bring that name back. I think so. (laughs) All right. So, um, because you'll see references to Peregrine Weathered and he... He bought the island to use for agricultural purposes. He was using slave labor. But he bought it in 1811, despite what you may read. It wasn't 1808. I have the deeds. And soon after, he kind of got caught up in the War of 1812. Mm, Okay. Because on April 24th, 1813, the British plundered his estate on Pools Island and established a small gun battery there. And then later during the conflict in 1814, there was a lot of maritime action around the island prior to the British bombing Havre de Grace. Um, And they destroyed a schooner and two sloops in September of 1814. So it was kind of a wild time right when Peregrine acquired the island. But he went on to have a very successful agricultural enterprise there. Um, He maintained ownership for more than 50 years. Now, did he use the island? Was it a residence or was it strictly just for farming? I believe he probably had a tenant who was managing the farm, but it was never anyone's primary uh, residence. It was always more an agricultural wonderland, if I may say that. And one thing we didn't touch on, uh, Susan, is why Pools Island? Why farm on Pools Island, this little two, three hundred acre island in the middle of the Chesapeake? So Pools Island is evidently something of an anomaly in Maryland. It has a very soft pH of the water, and evidently the land is... Gotta love that soft pH. (laughs) And the land is just very fertile. And we will talk a little bit more about what it was used for, but it's it's a little bit different from the lands around it. Why? I don't know that we have an answer for that, but it's its own little place outside. Well, I think what I found, you know, and this is documented much later on, but a lot of farmers would refer to the island as a little piece of Iowa Mm -hmm. in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And they did not need or require the use of fertilizers for the soil 
Right. I think Beale Bordley was one of the first to actually recommend using animal manure for fertilizing mm-hmm. just in generally like he advocated for new agricultural practices, including crop rotation and things like that. So it may be that he set up the island for success Possibly. by by creating these new agricultural practices that weren't stripping the soil of all its nutrients the way earlier agricultural way practices yeah. were. In 1824, Peregrine Weatherhood was approached by the state of Maryland to uh, provide a parcel of his land, about six acres from what I've read, to construct a lighthouse because beginning in about 1819 was when Maryland really started getting lighthouses and this was being carried out by Congress to improve the maritime navigation along the Chesapeake Bay, which is really like one of our major transportation routes. So in 1825, a man named John Donahue, who was a favorite son of Havre de Grace, got the contract to build the Pools Island Lighthouse. And that was, what, one of 12? So he would go on to build about 12 Maryland lighthouses during his lifetime. Um, Seven of them remain. And currently, Pools Island is the oldest remaining lighthouse in Maryland. Ooh, lucky us. Yeah, that's right. A little piece of history right here on APG. One of the many little pieces of history here on APG. (laughs) That's right. So the Pools Island Lighthouse is very similar to two other lighthouses very close to APG, including the Concord Point Lighthouse in Havre de Grace, which was built two years later in 1827, and the Turkey Point Lighthouse, which was built in 1833. He really only had two main styles of Mm -hmm. lighthouses. The one like that we have on Pools Island is a conical granite tower with a light on the top of it. The other type of lighthouse he built was where the light was on top the lighthouse keeper's house. So it was sort of an integrated structure. Okay. And the oldest example of that one is at what is now called Point Lookout Lighthouse. Point Lookout. Isn't that like one of the most haunted lighthouses in America? That's what I have read anyway. So um, How spooky. Point Point Lookout was built in 1830 down at the far southern end of St. Mary's County. So it's right at the beginning of the Potomac, where the Potomac feeds out into the Chesapeake Bay. But the reason why it's considered the most haunted is because during the Civil War, the site was used as a prisoner of war camp and a Civil War hospital where a lot of a lot of people died. Wow. Over 4,000 deaths were attributed there. And is this in Scotland, Maryland? Scotland, Maryland, yes. I did not even know that existed until I started this. It's way down there. I mean, you have to drive to St. Mary's County and then keep going to the very end. And then wonder why you're there. (laughs) It is a state park. I don't know. That you could that the lighthouse is open all the time, but I do believe that they run special tours, mm-hmm. so, just like the Concord Point Lighthouse. Yes, because again, with peace and love, peace and love. Please do not attempt to visit Pools Island and, and visit the lighthouse. But what you can do is that you can go to Concord Point Lighthouse because it is basically, if not exactly, the same lighthouse. Yes that you will find on Pools Island. And they still have their lighthouse keeper's house. They do. And it's nice and shiny and polished (laughs) and they give tours. And Susan, do I have a surprise for you? You do. I do. In this article that you provided to me (laughs) from the Clark County Democrat newspaper. From Alabama. Right. Now, this is Alabama. Right. And I'm not saying Alabama, Maryland. I'm saying (laughs) Alabama, the state of Alabama. Is there an Alabama, Maryland? I do not know, but I know there is a Scotland, Maryland. That's right. So anyway, an article is published in the Gazette titled, A Perfumed Ghost. Cue the music. A ghost haunts the lighthouse at Havity Grace, Maryland. The keeper of the lighthouse said recently, the head of the man, devil, woman, or whatever it was, appeared to rest against the wire frame around the lantern. The top of the head was covered in black, and the eyes and yellowish-looking inch or so of the forehead above them appeared set in a frame of black. Its eyes were as big as those of a cow and sparkled just like two big diamonds. 
There was no expression about them as they moved and quivered in the lantern light. He couldn't look long at them as they affected his eyes more than the bright, steady flame of the lantern. Where the figure appeared, it left a strong odor of cologne. The place which generally smells strong of oil was then filled with a perfume like flower garden. And Susan, that sounds more like alcohol to me. <laughs> I think I think there was something else going on besides uh, the oil yeah, fumes. <laughs> I agree. And this is from an article dated, you know, 1889 from the Clark County Democrat in the great state of Alabama. I guess there wasn't much going on. At the Might time. have been a slow news day <laughs> where it just totally terrified someone that they had to come back and share the story. But anyway, back to Pools Island, Susan. John Donahue was a Habit of Grace resident, and he, you know, as we said, he built 12 of the lighthouses in Maryland, of which seven remain. He served in the Maryland militia during the War of 1812 and helped rebuild Habit de Grace oh, in, never knew that. after the War of 1812 um, because he was a contractor. So he, he Gotta love those contractors. <laughs> So he was active up until the 1850s, and then he passed away in 1858, and he is currently buried in Angel Hill Cemetery in Habit of Grace. So the lighthouse was occupied and run by lighthouse keepers from the time of its establishment in November of 1825, when the construction was completed. They completed a house at the same time until 1917, there's about, um, that was the year that Aberdeen Proving Ground acquired Pools Island. So the lighthouse was still there, but they began using Pools Island as part of the bombing range. So it was decided it was too dangerous to maintain a lighthouse keeper there, even though there had been some families who had served years and years. It was almost generational. Right. right? So um, like the last family who really spent a lot of time there were the Kohi family. And I believe... um, there are still Kohis around today who mm-hmm. remember their times on Pools Island. So the lighthouse, as I said, had been automated in 1918, 1917, and it was active until 1939 when it was decommissioned and no longer used by the Coast Guard. Interesting. And it's funny because I guess you would say it just pretty much sat there. It did. It was It was just sort of, you know, a structure on the island there, you know. Even though it's off limits, people would come, I guess, and there was some damage to the structure. So it had been, the the lights had been covered with plywood. and, and so Oh, okay. It was, so it was yeah. actually like boarded up. Right. You would right, say. Right. Okay. So the lighthouse pretty much remained dormant until restoration began in 1997. Right. So so soon after the light was decommissioned in about 1939, they tore down the lighthouse keeper's house and the other structures associated with, with it. So that all was all that was left was the lighthouse itself. I believe was there a bell tower too? I don't know. I mean, it, I don't think was, it stands today, but it was I think maybe there was still a in the fire 90s. tower. Fire tower. Right, where they would observe the the fire coming in. So Oh, so the tower was there for testing. I believe the tower okay. was there for testing. Which I don't even think still stands at this t- at this time. No, I think it's 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 fallen into the water. Oh. But then again in two thousand and eleven they do a full restoration of the lighthouse. Right. And at that time, they decide to relight the lighthouse because there hadn't been a light in it since 1939. Mm-hmm. They decided that it's a lighthouse. It's APG's lighthouse. It should be relit. relit. So as part of Armed Forces Week that year, they had a big ceremony and they installed a, a solar powered light that um, communicates to the boaters around that this is APG. That it does. And you know why, Susan? Why? You know how I know that? How do you know that, John? Because I had the opportunity to visit in October of 2019. Ooh, look at you. When public television was filming a documentary on the lighthouses of the Chesapeake. Oh, that's right. I was able to visit the island. Um, We did not really leave the shore because Mm. there is unexploded ordnance on the island. Right, which is why you don't visit. Exactly. Ouch. Kaboom. And it's it's unfortunate because since the last restoration was only in 2011, I mean, here we are in 2019, and it's still, I mean, it t- it's taken a beating because it's right there on the water. Right. It faces the storms. The pain itself is, is just chipping away. Right. Well, you have to remember, 
the structure is almost 200 years old. Ah, stop it. <laughs> stop your excuses. Um, it's structurally, it's... It's, it's it not ha- going anywhere it has structurally. Structural, it has structural integrity. It's mostly cosmetic issues that it has because of the weathering of the mm-hmm. paint and things like that. But I, it is it is a bit creepy because it's like you, you enter this building and it's it has its... Uh, it's um, pretty spiral narrow, staircase, right? Very I mean, narrow inside. Right. And... For as scary as it is on the outside, it's twice as scary inside. And then when you get to the top, you know, and again, it just gets tighter and tighter right. I think and it, tighter. it goes from 18 feet at the bottom to like nine feet at the it's top. Tight. So yes. it's tight, It's pretty small. Yeah. And then you hit a ladder and that ladder takes you up to the light. And that's where they installed, you know, the new solar beacon, beacon mm-hmm. inside. And when you exit the lighthouse, one thing that I discovered, which was only about 200 feet away... That was chained off were the graves of Captain Elijah and James Williams. And that's pretty freaky because I'm like, who are they chaining this off from? (laughs) There's nobody here and there's nobody coming, which Susan, I believe, will set us up for our next episode. All right. We have been talking a lot, Sean. So I think we need to give these good people a break and ourselves as well. Yes, because I am exhausted. So I would like to thank everybody for tuning in this week for part one of Peaches and Punches at Pools. And we'll get to both the peaches and the punches in our next episode. Thank you for joining us.